I'm joined today by David Keith, who is professor of engineering and of public policy at Harvard University. Uh, you've worked in the fields of climate science, energy technology. You've been in public policy. It's so interesting now what we are seeing with regard to I, I think that geoengineering is sort of crossing a lot of these areas that you've worked in, and it's touching on a lot of different aspects that are increasingly present sort of in the national narrative. Let's start for people who don't know what we're talking about. What's geoengineering? So the idea of uh, solar geoengineering is the idea that humanity might um, deliberately make the Earth a little bit more reflective by some technological means, like putting some kind of aerosol of fine dust into the stratosphere, perhaps, and that that would partially and imperfectly and impermanently offset some of the risks, the climate risks that come from the accumulation of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And is this just in terms of preventing temperature increases or are there other potential benefits? Certainly not just temperature. Climate change is a whole host of things from changes in extreme temperature, uh, changes in rainfall patterns, uh, changes in sea level, uh, changes in the um, impacts on the natural environment, on, on um, species and, and ecosystems. And the evidence, uh, uh, which is certainly comes with lots of uncertainty, but the evidence is that a moderate amount of solar geoengineering, something that, say, cut the overall rate of climate change or if warming, if you like, in half, would uh, reduce changes both in temperature but also reduce uh, changes, increases in precipitation, uh, perhaps increase uh, reducing the, uh, the increase in extreme storms that are the things particularly destructive to the poorest people in the world. Specifically, how would this be done? In other words, what would be the sort of technological mechanisms that would be used to carry out such a policy? So in some ways, that's the easiest part. The hard questions are mostly all about governance and science. Well, we'll get to that. I think it's. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's reasonably clear that at least in this one method, putting aerosols in the stratosphere, that really existing technologies, essentially existing aircraft technologies, could be used to put, say, you know, some amount that would ramp up from zero gradually to maybe over sort of 25 or 50 years to something like a million tons a year of material going into the stratosphere, and that that could be done really with off-the-shelf aircraft technology that many nations could access and could be supplied by many vendors. So kind of variants of the technology that you see in a, a business jet, um, nothing all that fancy. So the basic ability to get materials to the stratosphere is something that uh, can be done at costs that aren't very different from the costs of shipping materials by air freight across the Pacific. One of the criticisms that I've read of this type of geoengineering is that although it might be effective in terms of the mitigation of climate change, that there are all sorts of other negative potential environmental repercussions, depending on what specifically is used as an aerosol. Have the developments accelerated in terms of solving that issue over the last several years versus maybe in the early 90s when there were earlier discussions of this technology? Um, I think the big perspective here is that because of concerns, some I think very well-found and legitimate, and some maybe a little bit um, kind of at the gut level, because of concerns about this technology, there isn't a large organized research program. So for example, although the United States is often seen as a place of sort of technological optimism, uh, uh, justifiably so, and although there's a huge overall budget for climate research of several billion a year, not counting all the money that we uh, spend, and we should spend much more, in my opinion, on cutting emissions, there has been no organized U.S. government research of any kind on solar geoengineering, and, and very little globally. There are small research programs now in, in Europe and China, and some in the U.S. I, I help to run one, but they're funded dominantly by philanthropic money, at least ours is, uh, because there's been very, very little government money. So the, the, the important answer at this point is that we don't know very much. There's, there's, there's plenty, and I can tell you some of what we do know. But to be clear, the argument that I and I think many people like me are making is not that we ought to do geoengineering. I think that would be ridiculous. The argument is that we ought to have a serious, coordinated, open access research program to understand more about how well it would work, what the risks are, how we'd control it. On the Internet, if you were to, for example, prepare with an inter for an interview with someone like you and research geoengineering, uh, 
you would inevitably come across all sorts of conspiracy theories about geoengineering. Sometimes the term climate engineering is used. You will then probably go down the Internet rabbit hole into chemtrails. And I've interviewed one or two of the, the chemtrails conspiracy yeah. theories. How did this start that geoengineering became so tied into some of the I guess I would call them not not making a value judgment, but merely from the way that that the material is presented, some of the juiciest conspiracy theories on the Internet. How did this develop? I don't know is the short answer. I think from what I understand, there were um, long held beliefs by probably a very tiny number of people that the U.S. government was sort of deliberately manipulating the ionosphere through something called the HARP program, which was a, a, actually a pretty normal nerdy physics program to um, try and beam microwaves into the ionosphere. Um, and, and a bunch of related programs that people who kind of want to see some <clears throat> nefarious um, coordinated action imagined were happening. And then as the more public discussion of solar geoengineering began to be more visible, say a decade ago, um, those two ideas were somehow conflated. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. What I think is clear is that um, the extraordinary spread of social media has really changed the way these things work. So that um, there's much more, you know, it's much easier to produce fake news as we've seen in, in lots of countries, including the US in the last few years. It's much easier to produce materials that appear to naive viewers to be convincing. And so you can get many more people falling into the trap of believing stuff that, you know, objectively to the mainstream seems really bizarre uh, and, and extraordinarily unlikely to be true. And that's true on all sorts of, of cases, but this is certainly a particularly odd one. And it stirs up a pretty high level of, of, of hatred and anger on the internet. And I think it, it probably will affect the kind of normal discussion of geoengineering, which itself is controversial, but in totally different ways. Let's talk now a little bit about the sort of politics and governance issues around this. I mean, certainly, I think we can all imagine how if you go up into the sky and you start spraying aerosols or whatever it is ultimately used, those aerosols are not going to respect these imaginary lines on maps called country borders. So logistically, who needs to agree to such a program? What are the sort of governance obstacles that that would be presented? That's a very hard question. And it's a, it's a it's an emerging question. I mean, for all of these um, global public goods, um, and I think that's ultimately what this is, if it makes any sense, including goods that, of course, like any of them, have some risks and side effects. The way we manage them is an emerging is, an, is a work in progress. So that's true for managing pollution in the ozone layer. It's true for managing global climate. It's true for for managing infectious diseases and, and all sorts of things. So there isn't a simple formula for what's legitimate. Um, obviously, international organizations matter, but so do coalitions of individual countries. And I think it will be some mixture of, of what some individual countries do, what environmental groups or other um, uh, transnational um, public organizations do, uh, and, and what the international organizations like the United Nations do. So it's, it's really hard to guess. What I think is really hopeful is that there are now serious emerging efforts to look at what at how that governance would work. So, for example, a guy called Janos Pasture, who is the lead advisor to the Secretary General for Climate, is now running an effort to try and develop uh, governance for solar geoengineering. One of the concerns that I have that I know is shared by at least some people in my audience with regard to whatever we may ultimately decide to do to try to deal with uh, human caused climate change is that rather than taking a development like geoengineering or uh, a new form of energy, whatever the case may be, and saying, OK, now we can use this to actually make a net improvement to what we're doing to the climate, that it will be seen at least by some as sort of carte blanche to keep 
doing exactly what we're doing, right? Saying, hey, now, instead of just improving the situation, we'll keep doing what we're doing, but we won't be doing as much damage because we've come up with this new thing. How, how do we deal with that? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that is the, the central fear that it, beyond any other has held back research in this topic. And, and I think there's ways in which it's both deeply legitimate and, and some ways that it's less so. So yeah, of course, there will be some interest uh, interest, for example, in parts of the fossil fuel industry. They would like to keep the party going and not reduce fossil fuel consumption. Uh, the hard truth is that if you want a stable climate, you have to bring fossil fuel consumption to zero eventually. And nothing about solar geoengineering changes that. You must bring emissions to zero in the net. Solar geoengineering can reduce the risks of climate change for CO2 that's already in the air, but it can't eliminate them. And so I think it's certainly true that some forces allied with, uh, uh, say, the fossil fuel industry that doesn't want to see climate regulation might use the possibility of solar geoengineering as an excuse for inaction. But um, the question is, how, how powerful those forces really be? In the end, the, the political forces that want to see our climate protected need to win anyway. And I think gradually we we are beginning to win. We are beginning to win the battle to restrict CO2 emissions. And I don't think that adding something that further reduces, perhaps significantly reduces, the risks to the most vulnerable on the planet, which is what solar geoengineering could do, I don't think that in the long game that suddenly means that we lose the political ability to cut emissions. But I agree it's a legitimate and hard question. All right, something we will be dealing with certainly for years to come. We've been speaking right. with David Keith, professor of engineering and of public policy at Harvard University. Thanks so much for talking to us about this. Thanks a lot. It's great to be on your show.